good morning, uh, Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, uh, on day three of FII 2022. Uh, we are here this morning to discuss uh, economic sustainability and the global supply chain. This session is powered by Russian of Saudi Arabia. Um, so the global supply chain uh, that we've become used to, to get products, services and labor when we want it, where we want it, uh, has taken a battering in the past three years, I think it's fair to say. Uh, some people detected a slowing down uh, of this essential chain even before the pandemic outbreak at the end of 2019, uh, with talk of the end of globalization then. Uh, but since the, the, the pandemic, trade wars, tariffs, economic slowdown, geopolitical conflict and soaring energy prices have all conspired to throw a spanner in the works of global trade, some people believe. At the same time, the growing demand for sustainability in all aspects of our way of life has raised questions about the basic elements of international commerce, doubting some of the assumptions of the system that we have relied on for growth and prosperity for decades. Some see opportunity in this. Uh, earlier this week, Mohammed bin Salman, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, announced the Global Supply Chain Resilience Initiative to position Saudi Arabia as a key link in the international commercial system. <coughs> Excuse me. We have today a panel of experts at the sharp end of, the, of international economic commerce who, who will give us their expert views on where we stand in this problematic situation. Let me introduce them. Uh, from my right, Sabah Barakat, Group Chief Executive uh, sorry, Group Chief Operating Officer of Roshan, uh, which is a Saudi uh, real estate developer. Uh, Anna Greta Chanka, uh, the CEO of Timbita, and she tells me that the best way to describe her company is as a digital transformer of the forestry industry, which I think is a lovely uh, uh, phrase. Uh, next to Anna Greta, Turki Al Sheri, the CEO of Angie, uh, uh, French company. He is the CEO for Saudi Arabia, uh, a, a sustainable energy and industrial company. Uh, next to him, Brian Lee, uh, a, a partner at uh, Geek Plus, a smart logistics company uh, uh, based in China, founded in China, uh, although uh, Brian uh, lives in the UK. Uh, Geek Plus is an autonomous mobile robotics uh, uh, company. So at the real sharp end uh, of, of the uh, uh, supply chain. Uh, and next to him, uh, at, the, at the far end, last but not least, by any means, uh, Fahad Al-Hashim, the managing director for the real estate sector at the Ministry of Investment of Saudi Arabia. Welcome all. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, I want to ask them, first of all, uh, uh, one by one, uh, for some kind of assessment of the scale of the issues that we are facing in the global supply chain uh, 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 network. Let me go first of all to Sabah Barakat. Sabah, how have supply chain problems affected Russian? Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me on the panel. Um, Roshan is a, a recently set up company by Public Investment Fund, and we're mandated to deliver best in class communities across Saudi Arabia. And for us right now, we're, what we're trying to do is design these communities to be best in class, design uh, features in them that are transformative to the way people live their lives in Saudi Arabia. For us now to be able to deliver those designs and deliver those communities, we're heavily reliant on our supply chain partners. And our supply chain partners vary from, you know, very early stage visioning of these master plans right the way through to our, you know, engineering consultants right the way then through to contractors and supply chain in, in terms of all the, the goods and materials that we want. So we're, we're, we're interfacing with pretty much every sector of that, of that supply chain at the moment. And where we are trying to de-risk the work, we, it's, it's all to do with capacity. You know, the, the, the market in Saudi Arabia is very hot at the moment with all, all consultants, all suppliers being very busy. And we're adding quite a lot of demands on those, on those uh, uh, delivery partners. So what we're trying to do is find out how can we work with them 
to allow them to expand their capacity in time to be able to meet the demands of companies like Roshan. So it's, it's very much to do with capacity is, is the issue that we face. Okay, and I guess the, uh, the booming economic situation in the kingdom uh, mm. uh, must put extra pressure on that uh, supply chain, does it? Uh, absolutely, because just, just sheer volumes. So the, the, the if you look at it, you know, the, 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 there's a quite a sophisticated supply chain within Saudi Arabia, but it's been sized to, to cope with a certain volume of construction every year. Then you get big companies like us come along and, you know, show them that there's a, an opportunity to uh, deliver a lot more than they're delivering. They need to then sit and absorb that information, de devise their plans for expansion, and then figure out how they can meet that demand. Right. So, yes, it's absolutely booming, but it's a great opportunity for them to actually expand their capacity, improve their quality, and actually have a business that will continue past the Roshan mandate. Okay, I get it. Uh, Anna Greta, uh, uh, forestry, timber, trees, wood, lumber, call it what you like. Uh, it is an essential product uh, of all economic activity. Uh, give me your take on the issues that we're facing today. Well, I guess we all have understood that um, we are going from one crisis into another <clears throat> and it's all about really a res resilience and in a way there has been winners and losers but definitely the technology sector has seen the acceleration uh, thanks to the COVID and thanks to the uh, war in Ukraine because it's really that companies understand that they need to have the full transparency of the supply chain, they need to digitalize their operations, they really need to make sure that they are resilient, agile and sustainable. And the only way to achieve that is actually through the digitalization. So um, I would say that uh, uh, companies um, will definitely start to look for more local partners uh, for the uh, supply chain and uh, from the political perspective we'll definitely see some nationalistic movements in that sense that more and more countries will come up some restrictions or export yes. bans and we have to understand that as well that if one country imposes some restrictions uh, most likely the reaction from another country will be also a negative one. So it will create a kind of a battle or this kind of domino effect. So I don't see, I'm quite optimistic person, okay. but I would uh, see that we will face a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, so the crisis are not over, they are just in the beginning. Okay, uh, localization and regionalization are very big issues. We will get to those later. Uh, uh, but can I ask you, just as a, as, as a kind of matter of fact, for my own interest, how do you digitalize trees? Well, we use artificial intelligence for that. So basically, technology can do everything. And I, I, I guess it's very important to always remember that it's never the question about the technology. It's always about the uh, mindset and the will. So if there's a will, there's always a way. Right, OK. So you count trees digitally, do you? <laughs> What we can do is we always uh, have the full understanding for companies like uh, what they have harvested, what, how much is ending up, what is the material uh, best to be sent to the sawmill or the pulp mill. So you are using your resources very in an optimal and most wisest way, so nothing goes to waste. I think this is also a very important okay. part that because forestry industry tends to be quite way, very conservative. So now is a time that they see that they really uh, need to digitize, digitalize their operations to, to use the uh, valuable resources okay. wisely. Right, sustainability is another big issue on, in this subject. We will also get to that in more detail later. Uh, let me move to Turkey Asheri. Uh, energy, of course, uh, is at the heart of this, isn't it? Uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the pressures for sustainability that I mentioned in my introduction, uh, but those are growing. Tell me, from the point of view of an, an energy company, how are the issues in the supply chain affecting your business and have they intensified in the past couple of years? Okay, so uh, hello everyone. I think uh, the, the, the challenges that we're facing in the supply chain when it comes to the energy sector are, are, are fairly clear. Higher prices are the immediate uh, impact. We're seeing, for example, when it comes to 
solar, 50% at the end, consumer price has increased. Manpower expertise is becoming a, 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 big, a big issue. Uh, when it comes to finding suppliers uh, from various countries, those that used to be reliable suppliers, suddenly because of certain issues within their nations no longer exist. And I would say also uh, significant delays on projects. So obviously when you're getting delays that impacts the overall system as a whole, impacts the markets, and, and things become uh, very uh, uncertain. However, I think it's also important to note that when challenges come, opportunities rise. And I think we'll hopefully discuss this during this panel that as a result of these challenges, COVID being one of them, immediately afterwards what's happening in Europe, people really started to think outside the box. And now what we're seeing in our teams, working with stakeholders, working with different uh, countries and nations, there are, uh, I would say, far more advanced ways of resolving issues. What used to be a nice to have has now became a necessity right. and a must to create. Okay. So uh, despite this challenge, I, I do see a lot of hope on what will happen in the upcoming future to okay. resolve these okay. issues. Okay, so uh, uh, you are uh, head, uh, he sorry, head of the subsidiary of a French company, a French-based company, which is a global company. Yes. Uh, 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 tell me, do you detect any, any difference in approach between this part of the world and Europe uh, uh, with regard to supply chain issues? Yes, it's a, it's a huge difference. I mean, if you, even within one country, you'll see different companies. For example, uh, if we're talking about NG, there's, we, we, we own 16 companies in Saudi. Each company was operating separately because they each had their own PNL. So if you see that in one nation, uh, different ways of, uh, of, of, of operating for, for let's say, uh, the reason behind the supply chain with that, within that specific zone, within one country is different. You can, you can only multiply that by hundreds of times when it comes from nation to nation. And I think that this is where the solutions that are coming up are happening, is that as a result of trying to find ways to synergize and integrate, not just locally within your companies, but also with your partners, you're able to resolve many of these issues that we're seeing in the supply chain. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, Brian Lee, uh, Geek Plus, uh, a company founded in China. Uh, and China, in many ways, is uh, at the core of the global supply chain as the biggest manufacturer and the biggest trader. Uh, your company produces uh, automated robotic systems. Yeah. Uh, tell me how those two things go together and uh, you know, what uh, issues have you experienced uh, in the past couple of years with uh, global supply chain problems, log jams, call them what you will. Yeah. Um, Actually, Kiplas is a robotics company, so uh, we facilitate the logistic industry, which is the foundations of our supply chain. So we connect different docks. Um, yeah, in, in, in the past few years, actually, we have um, uh, expanded quickly because one of the key issues in the supply chain is the shortage of labors. Um, and globally, because of the restriction of movement, um, the demographic changes, all this create a problem. Um, so the robotics become one of the key solutions to all these organizations who are short in labor supply. Um, and also there are a big topics in every organization they talk about digitalization to improve the efficiency. Yeah, because across the supply chain, the information flow um, uh, seriously would mitigate the risk, the, the disruption of the supply chain. So robotics is kind of um, mix of the um, the hardware and software together to solve the problem. Right. So I mean, in my uh, most of my customer actually is accelerate the process. Sorry, is a what? Accelerate. Okay. The yeah. process of uh, digitization through robotics and automate their operations. Right. Yeah. Uh, of course, if we automate everything, that doesn't do much for global um, employment, does it? Um, but. Tell me, how, how many people uh, uh, do you currently employ globally, and has that risen with, you know, over the past couple of years? Um, we <coughs> were seven years, uh, start from seven, uh, four people, now we have 2,000. So most of our organization... Over, over the past seven years? In the past seven okay, years. Okay, good. Yeah, so actually, um, most of our people, I would say 40% of our people actually devoted in developing the system, the AI, using of AI algorithm, big data, 
to be applied in robotics to provide end-to-end an -end solutions. Okay, thank you. Um, Fad Al Hashim, uh, I want to <coughs> bring you in uh, to, to tell us a bit about the uh, announcement earlier this week by the Crown Prince, uh, the Global Supply Chain Resilience Initiative. Um, you, you are from the uh, Investment Ministry, uh, which, which is pioneering this uh, uh, initiative. Uh, tell us about the background there and what opportunities you see uh, in, in the current uh, pro problematic uh, nature of the global supply chain. Absolutely, Frank. Thank you for the question. Of course, as you mentioned, the Global Supply Chain Resilience Initiative is one of the core initiatives of the National Investment Strategy. One of many national strategies that the Kingdom has launched in recent time. Uh, the Kingdom has always followed a structured, measured approach, uh, always proactive, rarely reactive. Since the launch of the vision, we aim to structure everything that we need to develop, uplift, and convert the economy itself. The National Investment Strategy and this initiative comes within a series of national strategies. We have the National Transportation and Logistics Strategy, we have the National Industrial Strategy, that recently launched. Now, supply chain resilience is not just the mandate of government. The responsibility has to be shared between the government and the private sector. And there are at least four key principles that have to be followed to ensure resilience when it comes to supply chain. So first of all, being proactive and enacting legislation that are more enabling, reducing uh, redundancies when it comes to legislation, hurdles to doing business, and also leaning on your competitive advantage. If we look at the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia specifically, it is well poised to be a center of a global supply chain. It connects three continents. It is six hours away from 40% of the world's GDP, seven hours away from the 80% of the world's population, and let's not forget that 13% of global trade already passes through the Red Sea, which we have three large, heavily invested in ports that we invested in. And that is also coupled by a strong logistics network within the kingdom itself. So the, resilience, the supply chain resilience initiative aims specifically to localize key industries. Some of them that are related to real estate is machinery and equipment. You might have seen as well another important sector, which is the automotive. We, a few months back, announced the deal to start a manufacturing plant for Lucid Automotive in the Western province. Now, that is not just one company moving its manufacturing to the kingdom. No, that is establishing a basis for a cluster of manufacturing to service a specific industry we want to be no, we don't want to just service the local demand of the kingdom, but we believe we are perfectly poised to service regional demand and global demand and serve, serve as a balanced, centralized location and facilitator between many economies in the East and West and Europe and always act as a balancer and a risk mitigator for global businesses as well right. and the global economy. Okay, interesting. Uh, 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 we've all seen the, uh, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, uh, uh, the lucid cars, I'm sure, uh, here outside the Ritz-Carlton. Um, but so uh, uh, the plan is to uh, manufacture lucid uh, somewhere near Jeddah yes, and export them to? It will be in King Abdullah Economic City. Okay. The production capacity will seek to serve local, regional, and global, so there will be exporting as well. There is already a fantastic King Abdullah port in the city itself. And we are also seeking to launch there and in many other locations, some special economic zones, to really incentivize and uplift the ability to access international and region markets okay. for manufacturers looking to be based in the kingdom. And, and, and these zones will be manufacturing uh, areas as well as logistics areas, will they? Will they? They will be manufacturing, logistics, service areas, residential. When we seek to develop projects, we don't 
uh, indulge in one specific site or industry. We should seek to be holistic to ensure that these projects and these sites we develop are sustainable and provide the balance for anybody that wants to live and work and be part of, part of the economic productivity there. Okay, that's great. Um, I want to talk about localization uh, because uh, this could be seen on the one hand as a, a byproduct of the breakdown of the global supply chain if things are getting more local and more uh, 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 regional uh, uh, and, and people manufacture and, and distribute closer to their own home. Uh, but on the other hand, localization uh, is one of the key uh, aims of the Vision 2030 strategy uh, to develop the Saudi economy, to, to, to provide uh, e employment in the kingdom too. Uh, so I want to ask uh, Sabah Barakat uh, about some of the, the, the issues and opportunities and challenges uh, of, of, of localization within this context of global supply chain issues. Uh Localization is a critical part of our business plan and actually of the business plan of any company these days because it, it's, a, it's an advantage in terms of minimizing your risks of global supply chain disruptions. So the more you can localize, the more control you have over your environment, the closer you are to your suppliers, the, the, the deeper the relationships and the partnerships and the synergies that you can have between yourself and those partners in the supply chain. We, we look, if you look at a, a company like us where we're doing hundreds and thousands of homes, you know, if you look at a typical home where you, you need, just think of the number of doors, square meters of tiles, kitchen cabinets, sanitary ware, light fittings. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands and some of these commodities we, we actually need in the millions. It's actually important that as part of what we're delivering, we leave a legacy industry behind us right. that actually can deliver all of these products and continue to serve the wider industry and the wider, uh, and potentially as, as we're bringing in best in class products, they can actually start to export regionally as well. Right. So at the end of the day, you know, Roshan isn't just delivering homes, it's actually an engine for the economy. Okay. And that's part, I think, of the, 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 the beauty of, of the scale of the mandate that we're working on. The challenge then becomes, how do you convince the local industry to manufacture the goods and services that we want in time right. for our, our because I guess at the moment, uh, these are imported, are they? To a certain extent, yes. Like everything, there's a mix of local manufacture up to a certain capacity. Once you get beyond that capacity, you have to import. And there are certain things, so, you know, wooden doors, for example, you know, the, the timber comes from abroad. And so it's, you know, a lot of people will just bring not just the timber, they'll bring the finished product from abroad. Right. What we're doing is working with the, the local manufacturers to see, okay, you might need to buy some of the raw material from abroad, but how do you do the, all the value-added services in Kingdom? And then that, you know, they are able to not just serve Roshan, serve the wider community as well, right. and end up with a legacy business that is sustainable in the long term. Because that sustainability, that economic sustainability aspect is critical. You know, when we talk to the local in, in investors in the Kingdom, and fortunately we've, there, there are plenty of them, they're saying, you know, we're willing to invest the money we're willing to put the time and effort, but we need to know that there's an ongoing business and there's the economic sustainability aspect. And so by us, you know, signaling to the market in very clear terms and giving them confidence that, you know, these projects are real, they're here for the long term. Yeah. We will work with you on partnership arrangements. They will then go out and do those investments, increase their capacity okay. and deliver the goods and yeah. services. Okay. And we're fortunate now we've signed a, at least 30, what we call master purchase agreement type partnership arrangements with local manufacturers okay. to help them increase the capacity, give them the confidence and allow them to go out and uh, make the investments. And with the best will in the world, it can take 12 months for a factory to expand its capacity. And right. so what they don't want to do is expand the capacity and then find out they've missed the boat. I get it. So we yeah. have to give them long-term certainty and visibility on the size of the project. Right, I get it. Uh, Anna, Anna Greta, how, how can you help Sabah get the doors for and, and window frames and flooring and all that for his uh, homes for, for, for 
Well, I'm uh, happy to share the contacts uh, from <laughs> Estonia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> this is what FII is Absolutely. all about. Absolutely. Networking is... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> business development networking, yeah. Yeah, but I think from the producer's side, uh, everybody un has understood that this uh, just-in-time production is something, a concept that you cannot really rely anymore uh, on. Yeah, tell me about that, because, because that, you know, that was, was, was the watchword uh, of global business for many years, wasn't it? But exactly. Uh, but now the risk no uh, of having a kind of some of these sub-products not delivered uh, uh, on time is uh, really a high risk and nobody's taking it. And from the other side, it is causing uh, very high stock in, in a sense that everybody is grabbing uh, they can to the inventories. And really, the fear of missing out is actually higher than ever before. But on the other hand, I think as well that um, when we talk about electricity, so Estonia is an example of uh, being highly dependent on uh, Russian gas. We were highly dependent on the Russian gas. And at the same time, uh, the local electricity production is based 95% on the oil shale, which has enormous CO2 footprint. Mm. So how do you now react during these turbulent times when the cold winter is coming? And at the same time, there is a war going on in Ukraine and then EU is pushing on the green turn. So you can just stop and say, listen, no, we are not doing anything. We are like uh, continuing as we are. Or you're saying, OK, so but this is a great opportunity to even more accelerate. And what we see now locally is that there are so many small electricity producers being connected to the uh, uh, network uh, so everybody tries to locally supply th themselves uh, with the electricity and also when we talk about gas then just a couple of months ago the whole Europe was uh, speaking uh, about the possible gas shortage now 90% of the supply or the demand is already uh, there and there are Fulfilled. loads of LNG tankers approaching <laughs> Europe right. So we see that there is a flexibility and there are always ways uh, how to handle this critical situation. But again, <coughs> you mustn't be like frozen, but look for the out of the box uh, solutions. So, so uh, uh, just on, on, on one uh, uh, matter there, uh, do you think Europe will get through the winter without freezing? <coughs> Yes, we we'll definitely will. We are even uh, ready to lower the temperature. <laughs> uh, okay. yeah, and we are, uh, I think it is again a very good opportunity for the new technology providers to come to the market and really scale up. Ten years ago, nobody was really talking about the demand side management. Now it's an issue everywhere. Each and every uh, student knows what is the electricity prices and when <laughs> to play. Uh, the TV game or when to shut down. So I think, again, this kind of uh, people are very understandable, but you just kind of need to communicate in a proper way and with the end goal, why we are doing that. Okay. Uh, we seem to have kind of moved into the mm -hmm. area of sustainability, and that is very appropriate because I want to ask uh, uh, Turki Al Sheri. Uh, about the issue of sustainability. You are an energy company, of course, uh, and you know, that must be at the forefront of your thinking at the moment. Uh, tell me, within the global supply chain issue, how do you look at the issue of, of sustainability? Uh, how, how do you advance the cause of, of sustainability within the energy industry? So I, I think when it comes to sustainability, <coughs> because I know some people have different definitions for it, but. In, in the aspect of energy, you're looking for long-term solutions, clean energy, and affordability. Some of these contradict, obviously, but that is the end goal. So how to ensure that you're decarbonizing your system, that the technology you're using is affordable, and the technology you're using is sustainable long-term and will, and, and will take you to the future you want to get into. But what I would also like to focus on is on the subject of localization, because I think and when it comes to the supply chain, that was an area where, where we found uh, alleviated the, the problem significantly. When you're able to find local products or you're able to support the local manufacturing, not just from the government side, uh, in terms of incentives and, and, and bringing in these technologies, but also from the developers and the investors. And how, and how that can be done is 
what we're doing is, for example, if we see a challenge uh, in a manufacturer that's in X country, but for some reasons is unable, due to logistical purposes, to bring his product to our country, we actually work with them on their engineering and IP to locate that product to a manufacturer that's already in Saudi. Right. So therefore, we're able to create that link, support that company to still provide us with their product, but localize it and, and, and remove that uh, challenge of, uh, of, the, of the logistics. Now, th that may sound easier said than done because in many cases, you also see local manufacturers or let's say assembly uh, uh, manufacturing facilities that are more expensive here than if you were to actually import it. And that's not, uh, that's not obviously beneficial, nor is it what, what we're looking for. But I think as a start, you do obviously have to go through those phases. You assemble, then you go towards the manufacturing phase. But it's important to get to that phase. And once you reach that phase, it's not just the product that you're producing from that one particular facility. You're also able to create that value chain within the country. So other manufacturers may end up using this local manufacturer's product as a feedstock for them to also grow. Right. So we're creating a, 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 a value chain. And I think an amazing example, just to, just to say this real quick, is, is the wind manufacturing in Spain. Before Sorry, the wind start, manufacturing. Wind manufacturing right. in Spain. They had, the supply, they had the projects, they had everything. But when they decided to go into wind manufacturing, the entire value chain, the products that were provided that, that were feedstock to that uh, a wind manufacturing facility, 90% of it was already in Spain. So it was very easy for them to actually go towards uh, wind turbine manufacturing. Okay. But it, it's by localizing, it's not just that one particular aspect of technology that you're creating, but you're also creating an, an ecosystem of several other manufacturers to also come in the country. Of course, yeah. yeah there's which, a, a, which I think is key. There's obviously many other aspects to, to, to mitigate the supply chain, but I would say uh, that particular item is uh, okay. has a significant impact. Uh, uh, but tell me, how, how do you approach that uh, uh, specific challenge when local manufacturer, uh, well, sorry, local manufacturer is more expensive, you know, than foreign imports, foreign manufacturer? How, how does Angie uh, uh, face that challenge here? That challenge, unfortunately, we can't, uh, uh, unless they become a uh, um, competitive, we're unable to, to, to work with those entities. So the idea is we try to support them in different measures, whether it's trying to create a, go from assembly to actual uh, manufacturing to help them reduce their cost. But this is really where I would say governments come in. And they really need to get involved, ensure that they provide proper incentives to, to ensure that the products that are being localized are competitive with the global markets. Because at, okay. at, the, at the end of the day, it comes back to us to provide affordable prices. Okay. And that's where affordability comes in. But does that imply uh, some kind of subsidy from, from the government? It could, um, it could be subsidies, it could be grants, it could be incentives, it doesn't always Investment. be yeah. investments. Long term yeah. investments. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Uh, Brian, tell me about uh, localization from, from uh, the, the perspective of Geek Plus and, and from the Chinese perspective, if you would. Yeah. Uh, you you uh, employ 2,000 people, you say? Uh, that's you know that has has gone up uh, from 600 over the past uh, seven years. Uh, are, where are those jobs? Are they in China? Uh, and and how do you square that with being a fully automated robotic company? You know what jobs are the humans doing? Hmm. Um, yeah, I can talk about a little bit. Just just echo about the um, localization topics first. Um, I think uh, being localized, in, in the past, the globalization actually given a lot of benefit from the cost of goods being so low, and everyone enjoying import the goods at a lower cost. So when we going into um, localization, it have to be um, very competitive to build the ecosystems in order to be competitive in terms of price. And uh, the incentive is coming in in order to build the ecosystem all together. So I think, uh, and, and on the other side, the, the customers um, have to put not just cost, but some sustainability into a picture because, you know, if um, talking about localization, the cost will maybe going up, the cost of produce, um, but the transportation will, 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 will be shorter. 
closer to market, more customization. So um, all, all, all this will be will be will be a, a change of the market customer perceptions that we, we have to ch educate the market and, uh, and change the consumer behavior. In, in my industry, we are serving a lot of e-commerce, uh, consumer market customers, that they, they sell the goods locally. So um, they have a strong drive to be more localized because there are a few reasons. One is disruption of the supply chain. My personal experience is I've been waiting for a dining table for nine months, <laughs> which shipped from China. <laughs> I've been keep calling um, the retailers saying that oh, when it's coming, they were saying I was ordered in March this year. They said they're coming in July, then September, then they said that they would be coming in in uh, 25th of December. Okay, so it's it's a dis disruption that the customer satisfaction going so low. Okay, um, so I think. Um, um, there are a strong drive that all these consumer sectors being localized and the customer behavior changes as well. Okay. This is a great example, isn't it? So, 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 so you are in London yeah. and, and, and you want a new dining table that's coming from China, China. Yeah. and it has been delayed and delayed and delayed, which is a classic uh, example of you know, global supply chain problems. What, you, you know, what uh, uh, reasons have they given you for this delay? Actually, um, the, the reason is the real. They just one sentence say the supply chain issue, the supply Oh, issue. really? Okay. So Maybe so the timber <laughs> <laughs> out of wood <laughs> to produce the, 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 the table. Well, it could be anything, couldn't it? Yeah, it could be port congestions or, you know, mostly we can see that the, the manufacturing capacity uh, because of pandemic, I say yeah. the labor shortages is yes. always around. I mean, there are different lot of supply chain being disrupted. Um, um, the one is the manufacturing centers, low labors, slow down the supply, the yeah. supply side, and also the transportation, the port congestions, yes. the high price of the air freight, sea freight. And then locally, even I see it's arrived the port, it takes five, six days. It, was, it should be one or two days to be delivered. Yeah. yeah. So all these are, are, are connected to um, uh, the supply chain interruptions. Right, and, and and you know, your focus within Geek Plus, as I understand it, is with the final stage of fulfilment. You know, the the, the last mile issues. Uh, you, you know, what are the specific problems there? Because that is where we really feel the effects of of the uh, you know global supply chain logjam, isn't it? Like, you are waiting for your table um, when it finally gets to Southampton or London or or wherever. Un, 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 unless that table gets to your dining room, it's of no use, is it? So, yeah. you, you know, the, the last mile problems, what are those? Um, yeah, uh, sure. Um, the, the last mile problem is uh, a, a few things. One is the customer expectation, customer behavior change. So, as you said, that the, the demand side. A uh, customer maybe needs some customization on their products. They may change their color, the style, the mix of it. Um, and they may have high expectation on how soon you can get it. Uh, recent experience is uh, I, I used to get on our order grocery orders um, from supermarket every week. When I work in Germany in the last few months, I find out they have micro fulfillment. That means that when I order, there is a cour courier coming in in 30 minutes, okay, deliver my meal, deliver what I uh, just purchased online. So all these actually disrupt the, the customer behavior. So I tend to order from getting the goods in 30 minutes rather than uh, one right. or two days time. Okay. So, so, so these will needed more seamless information flow across the supply chain and also the very efficient uh, operations to deliver the, the customer expectations. Right. Okay. Uh, Fahad, um, Turki Al Sherry mentioned, you know, the crucial issue of what governments can do, both to help solve supply chain is issues uh, and also advance the cause of localization. So, on behalf of the government, tell us what yeah. can you do. On behalf of the government is a big word, David. <laughs> <laughs> but look, um, well, on behalf of the investment. <laughs> look, um, the kingdom has set its sights on both localization and supply chain resilience a very long time ago. So 
when we're talking about localization specifically, there is several elements that has to be put in place before you localize. So design and ensuring that you design for specific available materials is critical to mitigate any risk of lack of shortages. When it comes to what the Saudi government is doing for localization, of course, we have a huge localization program. It's also supported by the National Industrial Development and Logistics Program. So we're not just helping or incentivizing people to set up manufacturing in the kingdom, which we are. We're building industrial cities, plug and play infrastructure, providing developer that will develop build to suit for those manufacturing capacities. But on the other end of the spectrum, the procurement side, we're, get, we're giving competitive pricing and advantage prices for locally procured goods. We're also sitting with those manufacturers and helping them assess what do they need to raise the quality or the, uh, the type of product that they produce to meet the consumer expectation. And if you look at the global supply chain and the many nodes that cause a risk in it from the production site to the port to the carriers and the shipping industry, then the receiving port, and then at the end of the day, the last mile. The objective of localization is removing specific nodes that could cause a risk out of the equation and ensuring that you provide lower cost, lower time, and that has to be coupled with uh, a look at a s planning these projects, significant timelines. When we're talking, at, talking about the role of project management, it is critical to avoid any issues when it comes to supply chain. At the ministry, what we're doing is we're looking to working, of course, with many partners, the Ministry of Industry and Mineral Resources and the Ministry of Transportation, Logistics Services. We're looking to incentivize uh, manufacturers to manufacture locally in the kingdom. We are looking to incentivize companies to set up warehousing, uh, removing any regulatory hurdles that might shorten the supply of, let's say, trucking, for example. Saudi ports operate 24 hours, which is something that we are very proud that we managed to actually get going. And I think it's, it's all about how you respond to those challenges. Challenges are there to help you uplift your performances. And thankfully, we have set in place many programs, many initiatives, many incentives as well, uh, fiscal and non-fiscal as well, to ensure that we set up the necessary resilience for our demand locally, whether it's the growth of Saudi cities, you look at Riyadh doubling in population, yes. or the new cities such as Neom, Red Sea and all the other giga projects, including Roshan, of course, and what is happening around the region, the rebuilding of Yemen, the regrowth of Egypt as well, and all of these economies, strong, uh, establishing strong regional supply chains okay. does not mean decoupling from the global supply chain, but actually strengthening the global supply chain as well, it's okay. itself. Okay. Uh, that's really interesting, uh, and, and, and the context of, of the mega projects, NEOM, uh, the uh, uh, massive expansion of Riyadh, uh, you know, those will be opportunities for localization uh, in their own right, won't they? Sabah, and you, you, know, you will be fueling this, of course. Uh, absolutely, and this is something we're promoting very strongly, that this is an opportunity now to strengthen the manufacturing base and the supply chain base in the kingdom, and as I say, you know, we're trying to, to, to deliver that positive message and that confidence to the local investors and the local supply chain that, you know, come talk to us. We're, we'll work with you to, to give you that comfort and that visibility to allow you then to make those investments. And I think, you know, the good thing with us and a number of the other Giga projects is that we all have a common objective. And that common objective is to deliver this, you know, sustainable supply chain right. in the kingdom. Yeah. And uh, we're starting to see the, uh, the benefits of that already. Okay. Uh, well, look, time has flown by, and I'm being told we only have a few minutes left. Um, <coughs> so I, I, I would like to ask uh, uh, my five panelists, uh, if, if they would, to uh, uh, sum up uh, briefly and, and succinctly uh, 
what, what they've learned from this session here today and also uh, uh, to address uh, the, the issue of where the supply chain, sorry, what the supply chain of the future will look like. Uh, uh, can I start with you, Anna Greta? What will it look like? It will definitely um, be more resilient than before. I think uh, we have the time to build up uh, new supply chains that will also bear the possible future shocks. Uh, secondly, I would say that I would see, I would encourage for more uh, private and public partnership in any field, uh, and I think we have uh, opportunity to see very great examples uh, here in Riyadh. So um, we expect a strong uh, political leadership from the European governments, actually. I think we have to be aware that the cold winter is coming and we have to remain stable and not to get into a trade war between the countries. Okay, good points, good points. Uh, Turkey Al Sherry, what will the future look like? I, I, I would say digitalized for sure. Uh, but I think also another important component would be if you look at the, the supply chain and the different stakeholders in the supply chain, whether you're the manufacturer, the supplier, the buyer, the end user, it's no longer every single uh, entity has, this, has a function to do. You're actually starting to see people playing other, other roles. And what I mean by that is in some cases, even though I may be a buyer, I can in some cases also be a supplier. Right. right, either through my stocks or stocks that I'm not using. Okay. But trying to, that's currently being done, but in more of an ad hoc perspective. I would say it needs to be more, uh, more properly uh, processed or, or, or in proper procedures, excuse me. And at the same time, what we're also seeing is products that are a, a piece of equipment I may be looking for at an urgent rate, yet a, uh, another client is not, for example, in such a hurry. We're, there's actual exchanges happening where we're saying, okay, I need this now. You got the same thing, but you were before I did. Let me have that product and you can take mine afterwards. Okay. But I would say is instead of just following a typical uh, conventional process of, okay, uh, procurement is a purchasing department. No, that's not the case. I think they, they, there's far more, uh, far more ways of, of procuring and, and dealing with the supply chain than just by simply saying, this is your job, this is your job. There are ways to integrate, synergize, digitalize, and ensure that okay. you're being as efficient as okay. possible. Uh, Brian Lee, uh, the future, I guess you will tell us that it's uh, automated and robotic. Yeah, definitely. Is it? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I have two words in my mind. Uh, one, digitalization. Yeah, so the information will be uh, going seamlessly, uh, more transparent across the supply chain collaboration different partners that's one um, that will be going to you know in the past it may be very single sourced okay it may go more multiple sourcing so the information flow collaboration through digitalization will be much help in and in, in transforming uh, this this process another one is my specialist is automations all right so more robotics uh, um, uh, at, at um, adoptions in the warehouse operations in the supply chains that will provide more efficiency and uh, 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 sort the problem of the labor shortages and you know increase the efficiency of the production I would say we, we have a challenges now is when we face in logistics it's not a fancy industry um, young people are not willing to <laughs> get into logistic industry to do right. the work so they would be now they are more intelligent workers. So the the, so the attracting, work attracting labour, yeah. 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 So attracting you know, talent. digitalized supply chain will give them opportunity to work on more uh, sophisticated uh, kind of intelligent work. Okay. While the the hard work <laughs> on the ground work will be done by the robotics. Okay, that's yeah. a very good point, Saba. Uh, 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 tell us quickly. I mean, I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything my colleagues have said. I, and I see a number of convergences happening. I see convergence between government regulatory authorities and businesses in aligning on interest and aligning on priorities of resolving supply chain issues. I see convergence and alignment between companies in their supply chain in changing the relationship, as you mentioned, from a very transactional procurement relationship 
to a partnership relationship, and I see it a, tr a transformation with, and an alignment between economic sustainability and environmental sustainability okay. as well. Right. So all of those are, are things that are playing at, in parallel and all converging okay. to try and resolve this problem. I get it. Uh, the final word, as always in Saudi Arabia, goes to the government. Uh, so, uh, uh, Fadal Hashim, tell us briefly how the future will look. Well, what I would say is to understand the future, you have to look at the past sometimes. When I speak about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, since 1975, I think when Saudi Arabia announced it will develop the largest industrial city in the world, which is Jubail, we were called that that is a white elephant that we are dreaming. And if you look at it now, it is actually the largest industrial city globally, contributing to, I think, between 7 to 8% of Saudi's GDP. When you look around and you hear all these announcements, these projects, it is normal to be skeptic sometimes. But if you look at our track record, growing from 190 billion GDP to a trillion in 20 years. I, I would like to say that our track record speaks for itself, and I would urge uh, investors to come and partner with us. But also, at the same time, I would echo all of the comments that my colleagues meant. Innovation is critical to attract new talents. Uh, technology is also critical to uplift the uh, skills of the workers and investing in human capital is the most important aspect for us to realize all our ambitions for the future and collaboration, whether it's government and private sector, government to government and individuals is also critical to achieve all our ambitions in the future. At the end of the day, we all share the same planet. What revolves or echoes in what at one end of the spectrum will be felt at the other end of the spectrum. Sure. So collaboration is key, and I think the future is bright. Uh, and I think working together, we will achieve amazing stuff. Great, uh, optimistic note to end on. Uh, thank you very much, my, my uh, uh, five uh, uh, very eloquent uh, uh, panelists. Uh, uh, thank you to the audience. Would you show your, your appreciation for them, please? Thank you very much. What a very interesting session that was. Thank you.